Okay, um, so that's the session started. We've got the recording. If you're watching on the recording, uh, apologies again for uh, the bit of the mess up in the time. So hopefully this is some use to you. Um, if you're here live and you've got questions or you want to go through it later, because we'll go through it quite a, f a fair pace, um, then you'll be able to review the recording as well. And I'll get Kate to post it up on the Blackboard for you all to review later. I'll also put this, post the slides from tonight up onto the Blackboard for you to review. And I'll be available on the Piazza Forum um, to, to answer any questions. So we'll, we'll get started. So this is the first of three GTA sessions being delivered in support of the Space Systems module before your exam, which I think is next Monday. Uh, my name's Ian Muirhead. Um, you might have seen me around in the labs and I've been in some of the lectures as well. And I'm a postgraduate researcher in the space group uh, where I research uh, low Earth orbit satellites. And, um, and, and I think we'll, 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 we'll just get started. So today I've just done the welcome and then I'm going to go over a few top tips on general exam technique, which hopefully might help you. And then we'll go through a past paper review and I'm going to be focusing on the first four weeks of, of the topic. Um, of the syllabus, so the space environment, orbital concepts, orbital motion, and then Earth orbits. And hopefully that'll take between 40 and 50 minutes, but we've got a lot to get through. So I'll go at a good pace. Um, and then at the end, I'll give an open question session that I won't record. And you'll have a chance then to ask me any questions that you need to at that point. And I'll, I'll answer them on these four topics as best as I can. If I can't answer any questions here, then ask you to pop them up on the Piazza Forum and I'll do a bit of research and I'll come back and give you an answer then. I'll put it in red so I did remember to record the session, but it has already, it is being recorded, so that's good. Um, and I'll have opportunities for you to ask questions as we go along. If you've got a question on something I'm talking about or one of the questions that I review, um, then you should all have access to the, to be able to put your hand up. I'll keep, I'll try and keep an eye on it. Uh, and then you can pop your question in the chat or I'll come to you and you can activate the mic. Um, and like I said, we'll do a follow-up on Piazza as well. So, We'll move swiftly on then. Top tips on an exam. So I know before Christmas, I think it was Kate did a session on revision and the exam format, and she went into what parts of each syllabus you, you need to know. And, and if you haven't watched that and you, had, you wouldn't have a chance to attend, I would recommend that you go back and look at the slides and you look at the recording because it was a real good focus. The person who set the exam told you what you need to revise. So I really recommend that you do have a look at that uh, and look at the direction that she gave you there's also past papers there are four past papers on there um, and again they're a good way to revise but i wouldn't solely rely on them because the same questions won't, might not come up again uh, but it's really important that you understand the structure of the exam before you go in um, and and it, i've spoke to kate today and it will be very similar to the 2021 reset exam which is some of the questions we'll go through today um sorry we've got somebody who can't hear us can i just get some indication that other people can hear me and it's a local problem for that student yeah you're okay okay cool sorry uh, if you want to leave and rejoin or test your audio um then it's hopefully it'll work so i'll move on uh, yeah so it's very similar to the 2021 reset exam that's up on the board and the quizzes so if you use them as a core of your revision and then other questions in the past exam papers to support that then it'd be really really useful and then when you're in the exam itself, what I'd say is read the questions first. Don't just start on question one. Spend a little bit of time to look through the questions and do see what's there. They'll be delivered in topic order, in the same order as it was delivered in the, in the lectures. So if there's some you're good at, you can answer them questions earlier. You can identify easy marks because some of the questions you'll know straight away and it'll take you two seconds to answer. So, so do that first because you start off an exam with zero points and you only gain marks, you don't lose marks. So if you can get marks on the board easy, you can relieve pressure on yourself later um, when you've got the more difficult questions, the ones that might take some time and struggle, and you can get time in the bank as well. So I'd really recommend reading the question paper and spending a minute or two just to identify which are the good questions for you and getting the marks on, because I'd hate to get to the end and not get the easy marks because I spent my time on a hard question. And as you've been told repeatedly, and it's been on the piazza and discussions, you're allowed one side of A4 paper, I would put key equations on that and I'd put them in a logical order and I'd know what the, understand what the variables are in the context. And by logical order, I mean I'd put them in order of topic. So I'd know that if I'm dealing with one, a, 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 something in the fifth topic, then I'd say, well, that's the area where the equations for that topic are. Um, and that'll allow you to go to it quickly. And if you understand what the variables are within an equation, you'll normally be given some variables or constants within a question. You can then write them down and say, right, I've got a, B, and C, and I've got an equation that has A, B, C, and D, I know I need to use them to find D. And it, help, it helps you work it out. 
And I wouldn't write constants on that piece of paper because as you'll see in the exams, you get given constants. So don't waste your space writing constants. And then on the right hand side about units, I would standardize inputs. It's a classic examiner trick to give you different units for a problem. And then you will make the mistake of not converting them from kilometers into meters or, you know, um, using the correct units. And that'll leave you with an, with, with, an, with an error as you go along. And it's a useful check as well. So if the units work, if you keep units throughout your calculation, if the units all cancel out at the end and you get the right unit, you know you've generally done the right rearrangement. Um, and again, significant figures. You'll see in the questions today, you get told how many significant figures usually you need your answer in. I would recommend that you give your answer in that number of significant figures because you've been asked to, but I would keep at least one more significant figure in any calculations as you go along, because that helps you to avoid rounding errors um, and rather having something to 20 digits and wasting your time writing that down. But I would keep at least one more significant figure than the answer asks for up all the way through the, the calculation. And then finally, if you understand the physics of what's happening and the science of what's going on, then you can normally work out whether your answer is physically real. Um, and if, you know, if you're asked for a velocity and you get something faster than the speed of light, you've probably made an error somewhere. So these are all ways that you can look at your exam and gain marks as you go along. So I'm going to move on into looking at the questions themselves. I'm going to go through a series of questions in each of the, um, the four topics that I'm covering, extracted from the past papers. And I'm just going to look at how we extract information from them. How we answer the actual uh, the question that's being asked, but I'll also talk more generically about the type of um, questions that could be asked on that particular topic. So the first one coming to here is the 2021 reset exam um, question one. So the very first question, and that's worth eight marks. And Ben tells me that your exam is two hours long, which means it's a hundred points in two hours and 120 minutes. So you get 1.2 minutes per mark. So for eight marks, that's nine and a half ish minutes to answer this question. So a reasonable length of time to work through it. Um, so this question is very, very wordy with a lot to read and it comes with a diagram. So let's do a bit of analysis on it. So first thing, it talks about the James Webb Space Telescope and it tells you where it is at L2, which was on the diagram. And it says that it's approximately 1.5 times 10 to 6, or so 1.5 million kilometers beyond Earth's orbit. So you can see on the diagram on the right hand side, I've put James Webb and I've drawn a line to L2. So that is 1.5 kilometers long, uh, 1.5 million kilometers away behind Earth. And then the second spacecraft it talks about is the solar heliospheric orbit, I think it's called, or SOHO. Um, and that's L1 because it observes the sun. So it's 1.5 million kilometers closer to the sun than the earth so it's on this side is l1 so we now know the two spacecraft that we're talking about one's at l2 one's at l1 and it tells you to assume the mean solar irradiance earth q earth is 1400 watts per square meter so what that means is all the output from the sun is spread out over a sphere that the radius of the earth's orbit and what's left in a square meter is about 1400 watts and that's a pretty common constant that you'll see in a lot of questions particularly when you're doing solar power equations and it's telling you the distance that radius is one au and you'll notice here they've give kilometers there and kilometers there and they've give this in meters and not to scientific notation and it's just a way of tripping you up in an exam but that's one au so that's the radius there of the earth's orbit so i've drawn these on and, and these are all constants that you know. And you're asked to calculate some questions now. And the first one is the radiance of the solar intensity at, um, at James Webb in watts per square meter. So effectively, this is the value at Earth. This is the value at James Webb. So you want to see how much energy gets here. And then the second question is how much energy gets at the closer spacecraft at Soho gets here from the sun. It gives you a simplification. So James Webb is not eclipsed by the Earth. So although that is behind it, it's not eclipsed in this calculation at all. So you don't have to worry about it. Effectively, you can pretend there's nothing between James Webb and the sun. And it tells you that you need the answers to four significant figures. So analyzing the question, it's give you loads of constants. And then we look at how we work it out. So we know how much, uh, how much energy you get per square meter at the Earth. And we know, or we can work out the size of a sphere, the, the surface area of a sphere at Earth's orbit. And that's the power of the sun, because if you add all them square meters up, each one with 1400 watts 
happening in them over the size of that sphere, then you work out exactly how much power was originally pushed out from the surface of the sun. And that, I don't think it's explicitly stated, but that comes from section 2.1.3 of the course notes. And the equation is the power density at the sun's surface is how much you get at the Earth in watts per square meter and the area of the sphere with a radius of, of the distance of the Earth. To work that area out, you then use 1AU, which is uh, given at the bottom. I've turned it to scientific notation because I prefer it. And then eventually you get an answer for the power put out by the sun. So the total power put about, out by the sun is 3.94 by 10 to the 26 watts. So that is how much power comes out from the sun. And now what you've got to do is work out what the ratio would be at each of these locations. And the way we do that is taking the equation here, and instead of having it at Earth, we have it at some arbitrary point, and let's call that point alpha. And by keeping the power at the sun, because the, that doesn't change, that's how much power that comes out from the sun, but rearranging then to say the solar intensity at point alpha and the area at point alpha, where the area is just the radius of point alpha's distance, we've now got a generic equation for any location in the solar system. And all we need to know to be able to work out the solar intensity at that point is how far away it is from the sun. So it's pretty straightforward calculation. And the way you do this then, the first one is James Webb. And the distance from the Earth you're given is one and a half million kilometers. And I've put it into meters to stop any units. And because it's behind the Earth, the radius of the James Webb's orbit is the radius of the Earth orbit and that distance from the Earth. So, so that's an important thing to notice. The area then is four pi r squared and the radius which you just include the calculation from here. And then you add it all together into a calculation for the solar intensity at James Webb. You give the power of the sun in the area. That's the full calculation. So I've done all the calculations and all the rearrangements before I've put a single number in. And then if you put all the numbers that we've got in there, so we've got the power of the sun that we've worked out. We know the radius of the Earth because we've given it. And we know the distance of the Earth from James Webb. You put all them values in, do the calculation, and you get 1,372 watts per square meter at four significant figures for James Webb. That's a good, good calculation. It seems reasonable. It's to four significant figures, as you've been asked. And physically, you can check that because it's further away from the sun than the Earth is. So you'd expect the sun's energy would get spread out over a wider area so it would be lower than what we get at the earth and that's true it's lower than 1400 so physically it makes sense and then you do exactly the same calculation for the solar orbiter but this time remember that it was closer so the radius of uh, of your sphere is the distance to the earth from the uh, distance of the earth from the sun so one astronomical unit minus the distance of the solar orbiter. So it's a smaller value. You do exactly the same calculation, remembering that you put in the minus in here, and you get 1,429 watts, which is more than 1,400, which is exactly what you'd expect. If you were closer to the sun, you'd get more energy. So that is worth eight marks in its entirety, and you've got about nine minutes to do it. So it's not a particularly complicated equation, and hopefully you can follow that. Is there any questions on this one before I move on to the next question? Stick in the chat, I'll try and keep an eye on it, but I'll move on. So the second one then uh, is question two from uh, exam 2021, and it's worth three marks. So three and a half minutes is, is to answer it. And if you know the answer to a question like this, it's an absolute gift because it'll take you about two seconds and you'll bank that time for the more challenging ones later. So the question is the ionized part of the atmosphere is called D, and then it gives you a list of different layers or none of them. And the, in the course notes is section 2.1.3. And... The atmospheric layers are all named with Greek names at the start. And, and what I've put on the bottom right there, and again, I'll, like I said, I'll share the slide so you can look at it as part of your revision. I've put them in order from, from the ground upwards. So the troposphere is the lowest level in the atmosphere, and it's tropos means Greek for change, and that's where the weather happens and all the air's turbulent. Above that is the stratosphere, stratos in Greece, which means layer, because there's, there's not much turbulence and it's distinct layers. Above that is the meso, the middle one. We've got five layers. Uh, Six layers, it's not quite the middle one, but it's close enough for me. And then above that is the thermosphere, and that's thermae, which is heat, so it's where the temperature goes up a lot. Um, and then beyond that, you've got the ionosphere, and an ion is Greek for going, uh, ancient Greek for going, so think of an ion, it loses an electron 
And then finally, you've got the exosphere, which is exo outside. So you've got six layers of atmosphere there, each getting progressively higher in altitude. And you can indicate what they are. If you kind of understand what the Greek word is at the start, it can indicate it towards you. So if you get a question on any of the layers of the atmosphere and you remember that, you should be able to answer it really quickly. So in this one, the ionized, ionized part of the Earth's atmosphere is called the ionosphere, B. Um, and and that would take you seconds if, if you remember that. And you'd, you'd stick the time in the bank. So the next one then, uh, this goes back into one of the previous exams, so 2018-19. And question 2A, this was worth six marks, which again is quite generous. Um, and the references for the Van Allen belt that it talks about is 2.1.3. And then the effects of radiation on spacecraft is 2.1.4. But the question is, describe three key effects of the Van Allen, Van Allen radiation belts on spacecraft components. And, and this is just something that you can remember. I, I remember I, I was in the lesson when Kate delivered it. And the first one is the most basic one, a single event upset. And this is just a bit flip effectively. Data is stored on computers in ones and zeros. And all this does is... It, a photon hits um, hits the circuit board that's holding a charge representing a one or a zero, and it flips it around. So where the computer thought it was a one is now a zero, and that could be really minor. That could just affect some data and be corruption in a data or a blocked pixel in an observation. Or it could be really major, and that one or zero could be the one and zero that activates your thrusters. So a single event can be major, um, but normally it's just the change of a data state, and it might corrupt some data. So So that's the first and basic one. The second one is a single event latch up, and that's where the radiation does affect and change um, the data information on a circuit board. And it means it doesn't work anymore. You've got a loss of functionality. So maybe you've got um, a mover of a solar, solar panel, but there's been a single event latch up and you can't move that solar panel anymore in the spacecraft. But it's not permanent. The key point for this second one is that it stops operation, but normally a power cycle and restarting the uh, restarting the instrument or the device or the part of the spacecraft would then make it work again. So it's not terminal. And then the final one, the single event burnout is terminal. So much radiation hits the spacecraft that it effectively burns out the device and it can no longer work. Um, and, and that, depending on what the device is, could be the end of your mission. So it's something to consider when you're operating through the Van Allen radiation belts. And he's talking about the different layers uh, within the belts of where they're more threatened. So effectively, if you were asked this question for six marks, you just say single event upset gives a, gives a bit flip and change the data state. A single event latch up is a loss of functionality that can be fixed by a power cycle. And a single event burnout would destroy or damage the, de uh, destroy the device. So again, not a lot of words for six marks as long as you know these points. And then going to question 2B in that one about the space environment, this is worth four marks and reference section 2.1.1. What's the principal effect of atmospheric drag on the orbit of a spacecraft in a highly ecliptic orbit? And in the bottom right here, I've just summarized some of the, well, all of the key points about the effect of drag on the spacecraft. So the fact is it only affects relatively low altitude satellites. Where that line is, is debatable and depends on the solar cycle. But it's probably not negligible above 600 kilometers, so you wouldn't really have to worry about it beyond that. But it can vary with the solar cycle amount of energy, and we do talk about that later on in these slides. And effectively, the drag on a spacecraft is energy lost due to friction. You have high velocity collisions of, of particles in rarefied air, and it slows your spacecraft down due to these impacts. Two different types of orbits it generally affects. So a highly ecliptical orbit will have... Um, if it was going around the Earth, it'd have a perigee at close to the Earth, so it would be within the part where the atmospheric drag would affect it, and then it would likely have an apogee further away from the Earth if it was highly elliptical, then that wouldn't be affected by the atmosphere. So all the drag effects on a highly elliptical, elliptical orbit are happening at the perigee or at the lowest altitude element of the, uh, the spacecraft's orbit. So as it goes through it, it would experience drag. And if you remember from some of the um, spacecraft maneuvers, if you do a maneuver at perigee, it affects the uh, the orbit at apogee. So the drag at perigee would bring apogee in closer to the planet, and eventually it would circularize it. So the whole orbit is circular at the altitude of perigee. So that's what would happen with a highly elliptical orbit. It would drag it in. It doesn't ask it in this question, but you may get a similar question is on low Earth orbit. So ones that are affected by drag, they're affected by them constantly because they're constantly getting... Um, constantly having high velocity impacts with rarefied air. So 
if it was elliptical, even if the whole, whole orbit was elliptical, it would circularize it quickly. And as soon as it's finished circularizing it, there'd be drag all the way around the orbit and it would reduce the altitude and the height until eventually it can't maintain orbit and it, 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 uh, it'd burn up in the atmosphere. And the way to combat that would be to re reboost to maintain orbit. So you'd have to apply some thrust to keep the orbit elliptical for a highly elliptical orbit in this case, or to keep the spacecraft in orbit if it was in a low Earth orbit. So there are the effects. And to pick up four marks here, effectively, you'd say something along the lines of the principal effects are circularization. The actions of rarefied air on a spacecraft at perigee would take energy out of the orbit. It would turn it to reduce electricity, make it circular. Um, and once it's circularized, it then um, start affecting the altitude. And you get all four marks for that. To go on to the next one. So this is worth seven marks. There's lots of parts of it, and I'll skip through them all. So again, space environment, principal cause of variation in the upper atmosphere uh, density due to the solar cycle, and how does it influence spacecraft design? So there's two parts. It's asking what's the principal uh, cause of the variation, and then what it does to the spacecraft. And you need to make sure you answer both parts of this. And again, your reference is 2.1.1. So the principal effect in the upper atmosphere is the thermal expansion. So the energy going into the sun makes the atmosphere expand. And there are day-night effects as the Earth rotates. And they're on a 12-hour cycle. But the major effect is in the solar cycle, the 11-year cycle um, of solar maximum and solar minimum. And we're, coming, we're moving towards a maximum now. And it does exactly what we just spoke about. So I'll not labor the point. It causes increased drag forces. Um, and circularizes your orbits and then degrades your orbits. The satellites require reboost. And then to answer the last part, then how does it influence spacecraft design? Well, if you've got to reboost your satellite because of the effects of drag, well, you've got to use more propellant. And that means one of two things. You either have to have a greater launch mass because you add more propellant on the spacecraft to last, to be able to um, mitigate against the effects of drag, or you have a shorter mission lifetime. You've only got a set amount of propellant that you can launch within your mass and you use it to mitigate drag. So the mission just doesn't last as long. Uh, so, so that's how I'd answer that one for, for seven marks. I think that's pretty, pretty quick. And then the next part of this question was worth three marks and it talks about atomic oxygen on a spacecraft and the principal effects. And just to be clear that atomic oxygen is, uh, is O, whereas We've got diatomic oxygen that you breathe in is O2. So this is doesn't really nat uh, naturally exist at um, or in great quantities at surface level. But when it's in orbit, these are high velocity single atom particles of oxygen. Uh, and they hit their, hit their spacecraft at orbital velocities and they're really reactive. Uh, and they start effectively um, rotting and rusting the spacecraft. And I've put a little picture there in the bottom left and you can see how it flakes and how it affects spacecraft. And it's corrosive and starts eroding the materials and can damage any part of the spacecraft. What it particularly damages is optics and solar array. They're really, really vulnerable to them. And it's a little bit like, um, like damaging the lens on your phone. It's, it starts to degrade the capability of it. So your solar panels won't be efficient, slowing, uh, making your mission shorter. Or if it's a telescope or an Earth observation satellite, it'll start degrading the ability for, for its resolution. And they become opaque and eventually they're just not good enough to deliver the quality you need. So again, principal effect atomic, atomic action has, it's highly reactive, it corrodes and degrades solar arrays and optics more vulnerably and they eventually become opaque. And that's worth three marks. And you've got to answer that in three and a half minutes, something like that. So relatively quick way to get marks. Has everybody got any questions so far? I know I'm belting through them. If you do have any questions as we go along, please do just put them in the chat. I'll put your hand up. Okay, so next one. This is again worth three marks. Just identify three sources of space debris. It's not asking you to, to explain them. It's not asking you to do anything major. Just identify them effectively. Write a list. Um, and section 2.3 in the notes is about the in-orbit environment. And they're part of a wider section called induced environmental effects. So I thought I'd cover them all, all the effects. So in case you get a question on one of the other ones, you would be able to answer it. So there are four types of induced effects. Uh, I'll answer your question in a minute, Sasha. Um, so there are four types of induced environmental effects. Um, there are static accelerations. So this is the effect of accelerations causing force on a spacecraft. And they really happen in one of three ways. So when you're transferring between orbits, so you're going from a low Earth orbit to a, a geo orbit, for example, there'd be forces acted on the uh, on the components. Um, when you're doing space station keeping, so you're maintaining the orbit, you're doing thrust. 
And then if you're changing the pointing, so if it was a telescope, you were pointing it in a different direction, then there'd be, there'd be forces acting on the internal component. So that's an induced effect. There's thermal loading, so that's the heat from onboard equipment. So if you've got circuit boards and computers uh, um, and data cores working on board your spacecraft, then that would cause heat and that would be an induced effect then the surface contamination of arrays and optics and that's really outgassing so if you fire a thruster a cold gas thruster with low thrust just to maintain the direction or to maintain orbit then the, th the propellant isn't leaving the spacecraft very quickly and it stays in the general area and that can kind of smear your optics and it can smear your solar arrays again and similar to what i was talking about on your phone lens before it's like having a raindrop on your on, on your lens um, and it distorts and degrades the capability so they're, they're the three that we haven't been asked about in this question, but you could be asked about in the exam. And then the fourth one is the man-made space debris. And there are six in the notes, um, six possible sources, and effectively just name any three of them. That's the breakup of a space vehicle, uh, a spent rocket stage that's that's been used, you know, a, a second stage that released a satellite then probably stays in orbit, an explosion fragment if, the, if there's been a destruction, waste from a solid rocket motor, because they're quite dirty motors, so, that, so they, they release a lot of waste. And then paint flex or dust. So if you mention any three of them just in a list, you would get three marks. And again, you'd have, a, you'd have about three and a half minutes to answer that. To go back to Sasha's question then, best way to prepare for the exam. Um, I'd flip through all the slides. I would absolutely go all over the quizzes and make sure I understand the quizzes, like Ben said. And then I'd look on the past papers, and they're all useful, but I would focus on the later ones because it's normally more representative of what the real exam is or what the current exam is because things change over time. I hope that helps, Sasha. Okay, so next question then. So this is worth seven marks. Um, and this goes quite quite way back so this is 1718's mock exam so i don't think this is fully reflective of how you'll get a question but it says um, in low earth orbit describe methods that may be used to mitigate the production of space debris so the actual answer to this talks about three different elements passivation and degassing so effectively when your satellite's at the end of its life you try and make it as safe as possible and that might be things like expelling any fuel or any onboard gases or coolant that you have that's no longer required well get them out of the spacecraft so they're not an explosion risk or they're, they're not a hazard um, you can design it to demise uh, safely effectively so graceful deterioration it's not just going to fail in one day and then you've got no control over it so you put robust um, and redundancy into the bits that you'll need to maybe put it into a graveyard orbit or to deorbit the spacecraft, or even just control fragmentation, having a bit of a, a, a structure that will break up in a certain way if it's impacted. So it, would, it won't break into a million pieces. It might break into three or four larger pieces without too much um, shattering, a bit like a shatterproof ruler. Um, and then the end of life disposal which I'll go on to in a minute, but the passivation and degassing are designed for demise. They're in this past paper, but they're not really in the notes when I look through them. So I'm not sure you'll get asked for them. So I've done a bit of expansion on the end of life disposable. So this is key um, for the mitigation of space debris. And legally, a space operator has to um, deorbit within 25 years. There's a 25 year rule. What they don't have to do is show how they're going to do it on launch. They just, in, you know, physically show it. They could, it could be something as simple as, yeah, we'll be in a safe orbit, so it won't be a problem. But normally it does mean removing it from its um, operational position and clearing the space. And if it was in low Earth orbit, it normally the normal action is to deorbit it, so to get it to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Or if it's too big to burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, the, there's a place called the Spacecraft, spacecraft Graveyard, um, which is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And people intentionally crash their spacecraft there because it's the furthest point um, from habited areas. Um, a lot of like Skylab, the American Skylab was planned to go there, but ended up crashing in Australia. And the way they deorbit it is one of three ways. They save propulsion from the mission. So at the end of the mission, rather than extending the, the lifespan using that propulsion, they specifically use it to deorbit and do thrust to degrade, um, degrade the spacecraft into the atmosphere. Or they do drag enhancements because in low Earth orbit, there's always going to be drag. So they either orientate the um, solar panels towards the drag to increase the surface area, causing more drag, makes it deorbit faster. Or they have things like drag sails, which deploy as part of it and then automatically collect more um, collisions with the atmosphere, the upper atmosphere, and drag it in. 
But sometimes they just don't do anything because they say, well, low Earth orbit, drag will eventually drag it down within 25 years, so why should we waste our time or fuel? Uh, and that's mainly what happens. Um, that's quite common, although it's quite irresponsible. Beyond low Earth orbit, where you don't have the drag effects, then you've got to do something else. Um, and normally that's a graveyard orbit. So that's an orbit that isn't really used. So you move your satellite from where it was operating. Um, and that, so in medium Earth orbit, that might be outside where the constellation of GPS satellites are. And for geostationary orbit, that's normally um, a number of kilometers above geostationary orbit. So it's outside that with the expectation that they'll stay there. And in reality, they'll stay there for a long time. They won't stay there forever. Um, so we're effectively saving a problem for our own descendants in a thousand years that we're putting a lot of spacecraft outside geostationary orbit and gravity is eventually going to drag them down but it'll take a thousand years so that, that's tomorrow's problem um, and if it's beyond earth and it's beyond the earth environment then what they normally do is put it into a safe heliocentric orbit so for example if you're launching something towards mars then the the thruster that put it on its tr uh, interplanetary trajectory would normally then be put onto an orbit where in a very long time, as far as we can model it, it would never interact with anything. And that's particularly important for things like planetary protection. You don't want a rocket body crashing on Mars uh, and destroying the little green man that we're all looking looking to find. So I would, in this question, discuss these four, four uh, three types, preservation and de uh, degassing, design for demise and end of life disposal. But I think if you get a question like this, it'll probably be an end of life because that's what it looks like in the notes. I uh, see so Ben's just answered a question on the forum, so I'll leave that on the chat. Um, right, so this one is all about Kepler's laws, Kepler's three laws, which you really do need to know inside out, and, and I'm sure I'm sure a lot of you do. So it's asking which of the following is not one of Kepler's laws, and it gives you five options. And straight away, the bottom one, E, is all of these are Kepler's laws. Well, if there's four options of laws, and we know there's Kepler's three laws, that one's definitely not true. So we can, we can, uh, we can cut that straight out, but we'll go through, we'll summarise Kepler's three laws now, just so you've got it in your revision. So the first uh, answer A, the ellipse law, the curve or path of a planet is an ellipse whose radius ve vector is measured from the sun, which is fixed at one focus. And if you look at the bottom left, I've done an extract from the notes here and I've shown a planet going around the sun and it's an elliptical orbit and the sun is at one radii, uh, one focus, sorry. And, and, and that's true. So, so, so A is definitely true. And the key point about Kepler's first law is that it comes with the ellipse equation of a conic section. So it's how you work out the parameters of that orbit. And you've got the ellipse equation here, which is the radius um, from the focus to where the spacecraft or the planet is. The semi-major axis, and if you think of an elliptical orbit, you've got a long axis and a short axis. The short axis is the minor axis. The long axis is the major axis. Half of that major axis is the semi-major axis. So this is from the centre of the ellipse to the edge. It involves the terms, um, the eccentricity. So this is how much away from a perfect circle it is. So a perfect circle is just an ellipse with a zero eccentricity. And it's a special case. Um, but there's lots of different ways to work out eccentricity. And we'll talk about another one on a later question. Uh, one way is this equation, which could be, on, could be on your equation sheet. Effectively, the maximum and the minimum of the, of the orbital radius. So the maximum would be at the aphelion around the sun or the apogee around the earth and the minimum would be at the perihelion or the perigee so the closest point to the earth or the sun and if you know them distances then you can generally work out um, the ellipticity or the eccentricity and then finally mu is the true anomaly and this is the position of the spacecraft or planet around the central body and it's measured from the argument of periapsis so from the closest point to the planet and it's measured anti-clockwise around so if your spacecraft or your planet was here it would be an angle from here round to where the spacecraft is and it's the true position of the planet or the spacecraft around there so that's a really useful equation that you should have on your notes and then i've just put here to summarize to put it all together again the different types of orbits that you get so you get a circular orbit which has no eccentricity at all it's a special case you then got an elliptic orbit which has an eccentricity of more than zero but less than one the parabolic orbit which is exactly one for eccentricity and then a hyperbolic orbit which is um greater than one so they're the four types of orbit you're going to encounter so ellipse one is definitely one of kepler's laws so once the second one then is kepler's area law and this is pretty straightforward the time taken for a planet to reach a position is represented by the area swept out by the radius vector drawn from the sun so here's the sun here's a planet going around the sun 
and this all these three blue areas are exactly the same uh, size of area and you can see the difference in the width of the path on the orbit itself and it's important to note that it's very small when it's far away from the sun and very big when it's closer to the sun and this means some important things for spacecraft orbits from planet orbits that the overall orbital energy is exactly the same it's just a conversion between electrical uh, with to kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy so it's got a greater distance to cover at the periapsis so at the closest point to the central body that means it's got a higher kinetic energy must be traveling faster so it's got a lower gravitational potential energy um, and a greater orbital velocity so it's fastest when it's closest and exactly the opposite if it was here at apoapsis um, further away so it's got the lowest kinetic energy it's traveling slowest it's got the highest gravitational energy and, and the lowest orbital velocity so uh, b is definitely correct and then we go on to c the law of axes uh, law of axes so this one, the semi-major axis of the orbit of a planet is always equal to the orbital radius. Well, I'll come back to that one because that always is a good indication that it might, uh, might not be correct here. Kepler's third law is the law of periods, which is answer D. So the square of the period of any planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis uh, of, the, of its orbit. And again, here's an equation that you absolutely should have on your equation sheet, on your, on your A4 pay, piece, and it gives the semi-major axis A in terms of the period P in this case, the universal gravitational constant, and then you've got two masses, big M, little m, and then a uh, constant 4 pi squared. And in a special case, which very much happens with spacecraft, is one of the masses will be much bigger than the other, so if you think of a satellite going around the Earth, the mass of the Earth is far bigger than the satellite, so we can generally ignore the mass of the satellite, in which case it sim simplifies its uh, gm over 4 pi squared. So it's a simplification. And effectively rearranging this says that the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the area, which is exactly what the law says in words. It can be written in, in numbers there, so p squared is proportional to a cubed. That is definitely uh, one of Kepler's laws. And just to point to note as well that there's a simplification, particularly when you're dealing with planets. I don't think you'll get it much in spacecraft. Um, but if you do the period in years and the semi-major axis in astronomical units, then it is an exact, it's not a proportional anymore, but proportional, and proportionality, it is an exact relationship. P squared equals A cubed in years in AU. Sometimes that can make an uh, equation quicker, a calculation. So, We've looked at this question and we know A is definitely one of them, B is definitely one of them, D is definitely one of them. So look at C then, the other answer we got, the semi-major axis of the orbit of a planet is always equal to the orbital radius. Well, if the orbital radius is the semi-major axis, that means the orbit's circular. And that's not a law, that's just a special case of a particular ellipse that has zero eccentricity. Um, so C was the wrong answer here. It was quite long-winded. I wanted to go through the three different laws there, but really this is something that you should be able to answer really quickly and grab three marks. Do you have any questions on Kepler's laws before I move on? Nothing seen. I shall go on. Okay, so we've got another, another wordy question with some values in it, and this is from 2021 um, exam. So this is question four of the latest exam you've got and be useful, and it's with five five marks so the first line it gives you the mass of the moon the radius of the moon and the universal gravitational constant and i've put them at the bottom of, of this slide just collate them together and then you also get one more constant in the second paragraph which is the altitude of the lunar reconnaissance orbiter so hlro the height of it um, i've put in there and again i've just just because it helps me work things out i always put them into um into meters or into a base a base unit you don't have to do that as long as you keep remember it later and you may not always use them. So it's asking you for two things here. So the first one is the orbital period, tau. So remember my last slide had it as P, which is how you commonly see it for period. But in this case, you've got tau and it's asking you for in seconds and to four significant figures. And then it's got a second question, which is the orbital velocity, um, mu in meters per second, again, to four significant figures. So we'll deal with the first one first because dealing with the second one first would be crazy. And the first thing we need to know is what the gravitational parameter of the moon is. Uh, and that's in section 3.1.5 of the notes. And effectively, uh, this is mu, the other one was nu. So uh, mu of the moon 
the gravitational parameter of, moon, of the moon is the universal gravitational constant times by the mass. And we know what the gravitational constant is, and we know what the mass is, so it's a pretty simple calculation. And I've kept this to five significant figures because my answer is to four significant figures, so I'm trying to avoid rounded errors. So I've worked out the first part. And now we're going back to Kepler's third law, which we've just discussed at length. And it's the same equation. I've just changed the value of to tau instead of it being um, P for the period. And I've included the subscripts for the moon and the lunar recurrence orbiter. But the information in the question allows you to simplify this. So as I just said, a moon is much bigger than the lunar reconnaissance orbiter, so it's a simplification. So we could get rid of this part and just have the mass of the moon. And it also tells you the orbit's circular, so rather than having the semi-major axis, uh, semi-major axis, we can just have the radius of the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. So that's absolutely simplified this now using our uh, calculation we've just done for the moon's gravitational constant. We've now effectively got three terms there. Tau is the one we need. We've worked this one out. This is a constant, so we need to know the radius of the lunar reconnaissance orbiter's um, or orbit. And that is really simple because you're given the radius of the moon and you're given the height of the orbit, so you just add them together and effectively that will tell you um, what, what value you're missing. You put that back in the original equation, do a bit of jiggery-pokery, rejig the equation so it's in the right format, so your, um, your subject is tau. And then you should come out with an answer of six, seven, nine, one seconds to four significant figures. So that's exactly what they asked for. The answer is in seconds, it is to four significant figures. And to do a physical check, well, that comes to something like 113 minutes. And, and you'll have talked about in the lessons about Earth orbits, and they're about 90 minutes long. And this might seem strange because it's only 50 kilometers above the moon, and the moon's much smaller, so it hasn't got as far to go round but it takes longer than a low Earth orbit. And the reason for that is a smaller body has lower gravity, so it's a slower orbit. It doesn't need to travel as fast to maintain its orbit. So, so that physical check, if you didn't know that, might trip you up. Um, but it's always worth having to think about why that might be the case for, for your answer. So we've answered the first part, and now we're going to go on to the velocity. And you've got the vis viva equation, and that's in section 3.2.4. And this is for closed orbits um, and is used generically um, and you can see on the second line here, and it's in terms of the radius, the semi-major axis, and a gravitational parameter, um, where nu is the velocity. So to look at our particular case then, where we've got a gravitational parameter of the moon, which could go on the numerator of both parts, uh, of both fractions. And because it's a circular, or circular orbit, we can use the radius instead of the semi-major axis. So this simplifies it, and effectively we can just have the square root of the moon's gravitational parameter over the radius. And we know both of these. We've calculated them, so it's quite an easy calculation. So if you put in the values you already have, eventually that'll come to... 1654 meters per second. So we've got it to four significant figures in the right units as asked. And then to do a physical check, it's 1.65 kilometers per second. If you think back to your lessons, a low Earth orbit is probably between seven and eight kilometers per second. So to justify what I just said, this is going to be a much slower orbit to get around the moon. It doesn't need to travel as fast as it does around the Earth because the gravitation uh, forces are less. So that was worth five, five marks to do them two calculations. I think that's probably a lot of calculations um, for five marks, but not too complicated and you're given most of the values. It's just a matter of having the equations, knowing what uh, variables you short uh, uh, and putting them in and do, doing the calculation. So question five, again, this is worth five marks and this should be really straightforward for you. So we said when we were talking about um, the eccentricity of an orbit, that a circle has an eccentricity of zero, an ellipse is between zero and one, a parabola is exactly one, and a hyperbola is greater than one. So to fill this in then, if it's saying it's greater than one, A is hyper, uh, hyperbolic, B would be an elliptical orbit, C would be a parabolic orbit, and then D um, always equal to the radius. Well, that was the one that was wrong in the previous question. It wasn't one of Kepler's laws. That was just the statement they made. Um, so that is a circular orbit, E equals zero, just a special case. So pretty quick to get five marks there, if you know the four orbits. Going on to orbital motion then. Um, again, so this is worth three marks, and it's just asking you to pick one of the answers. So all you've got to do is multiple choice. Um, so the first thing you do is process of elimination, work out what's not true. 
But we'll go down from A to E and see how it goes. So I've just replicated what I said earlier about Kepler's second laws, and we're talking about the speed at different points in the orbit, and we're talking about the potential energy and where it moves faster and where it moves slower. So to go from A, the spacecraft travels faster the closer it is to Jupiter. Well, that makes sense to me. Peri-Jove would be an orbit around Jupiter. Uh, so uh, the periapsis, the closest point to an orbit, is when it travels faster. And we can see that in the di diagram in the bottom left. It's got to go faster to cover a greater a greater distance. So straight away, it sounds like A's right. You know, if you wanted, you could stop and not, not do it. But it's probably worth it for three marks just to double check the rest. So B, the spacecraft travels at a uniform speed throughout its orbit. Well, we know that's not true in ellipse. It goes faster when it's further away and it goes slower. Uh, sorry, it goes faster when it's closer and slower when it's further away. Um, in a circular orbit, it does travel at a uniform speed. So again, that's a special case, but this is an elliptical orbit, so it's definitely not true. C, the spacecraft travels slower the closer it is to Jupiter. Well, that's the wrong way around. It travels slower the further it is from Jupiter. We know that's wrong. D, A, B, and C are all true. Well, just looking at that, even if you didn't know anything, it can't travel faster when it's closer and slower when it's closer. because It says an A and C, so they contradict each other. So D definitely isn't true. And E, it's impossible to travel in an elliptical orbit around Jupiter. Well, that's obviously not true. You can go in an orbit around a, a, a spherical body. Um, so the answer here is clearly A. You know Kepler's second law, second law, you should be able to jump straight into it, pick up three marks in a matter of seconds and move straight on. So a bit of a wordy one then. So this was question seven. This is worth eight marks from the reset. And you're given a number of, uh, of values. There's loads of words about it being Sputnik and launched in 1957, but none of that really matters. What matters is it's an elliptical orbit. So mark down that's elliptical because that affects your equations later. The radius at perigee it gives you and it gives it you in kilometers. So I've put that in my, my list of constants at the bottom and I've put it in scientific notation to meters just because it helps me. And it's told you the same at apogee. So when it's furthest away, and it gives you the gravitational parameter of the Earth. Um, and it's actually, it's given the gravitational parameter in terms of kilometers cubed per second squared. So I think we probably stay in kilometers all the way through to try and simplify it. It looks like they're already in the same units, but just one to be aware of. And the first part of the question then, calculate the semi-major axis of the orbit A in kilometers to four significant figures. So there's lots of ways of doing this. There was an equation I shown earlier to do with the, um, the radius at perigee and apogee that you could use. But the way I'm going to use here is uh, it's slightly different. It's just add them together and divide it by two rather than doing all the um, RA plus RP over RP minus RA uh, for eccentricity. In fact, I'm waffling that for eccentricity. This is the way you do semi-major axis. Um, so you add together the distance from the sun to the perigee and then the distance from of the Earth to the perigee in this case, and the Earth to the apogee, add them together, divide them by two, and that gives you your semi-major axis. So pretty straightforward, gives you just under 7,000 kilometers to four significant figures. So you've got the first question. Sorry about that, confused myself there. The second one is the eccentricity of orbit. This is the one that there's multiple ways of doing it. So you can use RA and RP, like that was on the previous slide, or in fact, you could use this equation because it's useful to know that because of where the true anomaly is, it kind of cancels out the equation and it rearranges it. So the radius at perigee is a semi-major axis timed one minus the eccentricity and, it, and then one plus the eccentricity for, for the apogee. So I'd have them two equations on your, um, on your equation sheet. In this case, we're going to rearrange it and use the radius at perigee. And that gives us an ellipticity of 0 0.052. So if you put all the values in, it would cancel out and that's what you'd get. And that means it's a relatively uh, elliptical orbit. So parts three and four, we're going to do together. So these are the perigee velocity, uh, VP in kilometers per second to four significant figures. And then the same for the apogee. And this is the vis viva equation for closed orbits that we did before. But the last time we used it, we could simplify it. We could simplify it because it was a circular orbit. So the radius was the same. But that's not the case here because it's an elliptical orbit. So we've got a radius and a semi-major axis. So to find the velocity um, for the perigee and for the apogee using the subscripts P and A, um, we just change the variables into, into the variables for Earth. So the, use, the gravitational parameter for Earth, the radius at perigee, and then the semi-major axis we've found previously, and exactly the same for apogee. And then we do the calculations, 
and we've got two speeds there. So we've got 7.975 kilometers per second uh, at perigee. And then at apogee, we've got 7.186 kilometers per second. And as a physical check to look at them, well, we know things are faster when they're closer. So when they're at perigee and slow when they're further away. And the velocity we've got at perigee is higher than the velocity we've got at apogee. So it's faster at perigee. So that physically makes sense. And we've calculated it in the right units to the right accuracy for significant figures. And then the last one is the orbital period tau in minutes to two significant figures. And it's the same equation we saw before. And it's the same simplification because Sputnik was much smaller than the Earth. Um, so we don't need to worry about that. We do the rearrangement for tau, put in our value of our semi-major axis and the gravitational parameter. And it comes to 96 minutes. It asks for it in, in minutes. So we, we calculate and, and work it out in that way. And again, as a physical check, you did it in all the lessons. It's about 90 minutes for a low Earth orbit. So 96 minutes is reasonable. It's not too far off. So you know it physically works. So you've now got a list of all these parameters. You've got the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, the perigee and apogee velocity, and the orbital period. Uh, and that's got you eight marks to do them calculations. So this is actually quite a lot of calculations and applications as you go through. I'm not going to go through any more questions. I just want to revise. Um, some of the last points and you can take these slides away and have a look and go over them. So it'll be important that you know um, the Keplerian orbital elements. So these are the parts that make up a satellite orbit and how you define that satellite orbit. And there's six of them. Um, and that's the semi-major axis. And that's the shape of the orbit. That's how far away the spacecraft will be from the, from the central body from the Earth. Um, the eccentricity E, which is the shape of the orbit, how squashed that circle is. The inclination, the tilt of the orbit, and that tilt of the orbit is away from the equator, as if it was the Earth. That is the reference point, the equator on the Earth in an Earth-centered Earth inertial frame. So it's tilted is an inclination. And the more it's tilted, the higher the inclination, up until you get 90 degrees, where it's directly over a polar orbit. And then it tips over past 90 degrees and will go all the way to 180 degrees, which would then be a retrograde orbit. Your satellite would be going in the opposite direction of the Earth's orbit. So prograde up to 90 degrees, retrograde to an inclination of 180 degrees, it's going the wrong way. And then the right ascension of the ascending node is the twist of the orbit is how it's moved around in a circle on the equator. And that's linked from the ascending node of the vernal equinox. So this was something that was asked on the Piazza forum that I answered. I don't know if everybody saw it. So we need a reference direction. And historically, the reference direction was the vernal equinox, which is, um, which is the equinox that happens in March. And when it was first measured by the ancient Greeks, the sun was measured to be at the first point of the constellation Aries. Um, and that's why the sign for the vernal equinox and the sign for the reference direction is the, is the sign of the ram. If you look at it, it looks like a little pair of horns. So that's from astronomy. But that doesn't really work for the Earth because the procession moves about a degree every 70 something years. And since the age of the ancient Greeks, it's moved quite a lot. So we now no longer use that in Earth-centered uh, frames for for spacecraft for earth orbiting spacecraft astronomy still uses that it still uses a thing called the first point of aries because that's boy where it uh, isn't worried directly about the earth's position it's worried more about the stars but for spacecraft and um, they use something called the j2000 reference direction i just said that it processes at about 70 odd years i think it's 72 years um so every 50 years a reference direction is measured it's agreed and everybody uses that single point as the x direction in Cartesian coordinates. So that's the point where you measure your right ascension of the ascending node off. And in 50 years from the last measurement, they'll do another measurement. So before the procession moves it by a degree. So there'll be from 2050 onwards, um, there'll be a new reference direction and that'll be J2050. So it's always important that you, um, you understand your six orbital elements, but actually what the reference direction is and where that's defined. So the right essential ascending node then is just an angle from that reference direction to the point where it crosses the equator. So the spacecraft is traveling from the southern hemisphere, from the north, northern hemisphere in, in this diagram. It would then be um, at that point is where the ascending node is. And that would be that angle between the vernal equinox would then be the right ascension of the ascending node. The next one is the ar ar argument of periapsis. And this is how much the orbit's rotated, and it's where the, peri uh, the perigee for an Earth orbit and satellite is. So the argument of periapsis, again, is now measured from the ascending node round to the point where the, per uh, the, peri the perigee of the spacecraft is. And then the true anomaly, so the actual position of the spacecraft is measured from the argument of periapsis. Uh, 
anti-clockwise round to where the satellite's position is. So there are six orbital elements and you do need to know what all six of them are. So I'd revise that and make sure you can kind of recognize them on, on, on this kind of uh, diagram. And then you talk about Earth orbits themselves then. So the, so the final part of this section, I understand that I've been talking for ages. So I put some references there. Um, 3.3.5 is the types of Earth orbit, 3.3.6 is the ground tracks, and I've put a link on these slides, and I'll share the slides so you can get to this link, and I found a really useful um, FAA, the US governance body, um, had some educational material on describing orbits, and I think it describes it really clearly and will help you understand the ground tracks particularly really well. So list of types of Earth orbits then, the notes, 3.3.5, uh, um, talk about these different Earth orbits. And, and I would look at what the advantages and disadvantages are, because that's a quick question that you might be asked. Um, what's the advantage and disadvantages of LEO? And, and you should be able to just pick the answer out quite quickly. Um, so low Earth orbit, medium Earth orbit, a geosynchronous uh, orbit and a geostationary orbit, I know the difference between them. And then a highly elliptical orbit, which is normally the Molnir or the Tundra orbit, the one that um, was Russian designed to look over the Arctic and also do spy satellites over the United States. And I'll come on to that in a minute. And then a special type of low Earth orbit was the sun synchronous orbit, which is a retrograde polar orbit used to see uh, to do Earth observation quite a lot. It's a very popular orbit. In fact, I think it's the most popular orbit used um, is a sun synchronous orbit. Um, and understand what type of missions that they're, they're, they're useful for and why you'd use them. So GPS uses MEO, a lot of communications uses geostationary orbits, and understanding that. And all these different orbits, as it uh, as they go around the Earth, leave a ground track on, on the Earth itself, and that's represented on a map of the Earth. And there's certain things you can tell about the orbital parameters just by looking at the ground track um, and, and the, way it, the way it runs across the Earth. So the first one is the inclination. So the orbital parameter I is the maximum latitude of the ground track. So if you look at the diagram I've got here in the center, the maximum latitude here is about 60 degrees north. That means the inclination of the orbit is about 60 degrees and it alternates at a highest point of 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south. So it's tipped and the highest point will be 60 degrees north, the lowest point will be 60 degrees south when it looks at the Earth. So that's easy to spot directly from map. You can just read that straight off, off the ground track. The next one is the orbital period. And this, the time in minutes, is given by the displacement between the orbit of orbital track, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, and um, the rotational rate of the Earth. So ultimately, unless you're in a geostationary orbit or, or an orbit, uh, geosynchronous orbit, the spacecraft is lower than that, it's going to move faster than the Earth rotates, which means you'll do a full orbit, but the Earth hasn't gone fully round, so your next orbit will be displaced because of that, um, that distance in speed. And that's the delta L. The shift between successive orbits in degrees. So if you can measure off the map here, and you'll notice across the top, you've, you've got the degree values and across the bottom, if you could measure the distance there and then divide that by the rotation of the Earth, it will give you the orbital period in minutes. And this ground track example shows that. Here's a couple of orbits, it's displaced once, and then it's displaced second time by the same distance as the spacecraft goes around the orbit. And then the orbital altitude, well, you now know the orbital period, and you can do the calculations as before, and this is simplified for a circular orbit, circular orbit again. Um, and the radius, you, you, you use the radius there, but just remember that the radius of an orbit is just the altitude, so the height, take away the radius of the Earth. And again, when you're doing these kind of questions, remember the units. It's the way they'll trick you up, but they'll normally give you the constant of what the radius of the Earth is, and you just work out the orbital altitude. So you can find out the inclination, the orbital period, and the altitude just by looking at the ground track quite simply. And then I'll just give you some examples of this. So the top one then are examples of orbital periods. And going from A to E, we've got longer orbital periods. So if you think of the spacecraft traveling, it travels over more of the Earth because it's traveling faster um, over a shorter period. If it's lower to the Earth, it's traveling faster. So A has a very long orbital period on the ground track. And you notice they all have about the same inclination. In fact, they all have exactly the same inclination. So A has a shorter period. B is slightly longer, so that's eight hours. C is 18 hours. And then D and E both are both geostation, uh, geosynchronous orbits. But D is a geosynchronous orbit that's not on the equator, so it has an inclination. And what that means is it does a map of a figure of eight up and down above the orbit as it goes. 
And that often happens with communication satellites towards their end of their lifetime. They don't have enough fuel to station keep, so they use the station keeping to stop them going east-west. They use the fuel, but they don't bother doing north-south station keeping, so it does a figure of eight and you have to track them. And that's quite common with communication satellites. But E is the perfect communication satellite because it's geostationary. It's got zero inclination. It's exactly on the equator um, and it doesn't move. It's a fixed point in the sky. Something else I'll say about these orbits as well. One thing to note is a circular, circular orbit is um, it's symmetric north and south of the equator. So these are all circular orbits and it's symmetric. If you put a line across, folded it like a piece of paper they'd fit on top of each other they'd be they'd be symmetric they'd have the same shape um an elliptical orbit is not symmetric above the equator so you can identify um whether it's circular or elliptic that way and then i'll go on quickly about orbital incl inclination again it's just simply reading off it so a is about 10 degrees b is about 30 degrees c is about 50 degrees and then d is about 85 degrees and it looks strange and a bit boxy here solely because you're trying to put a globe on a flat square map. Um, it's just a projection of a map, but really it's going to the highest point at 85 degrees in D and then coming back down. So pretty easy to see the ground tracks just by reading straight off it. And then to go a sub, uh, across some other ground tracks then, and again, when you re your revision, come and look back at these slides, because if you get a question that says, what's this ground track? If you recognize these ground tracks, then it's really easy to be able to just pick it out and get the marks and move on. So the first one I've put here is a sun synchronous orbit, and it's a subset of LEO, and you know it's probably a low Earth orbit because it's got lots of tracks in it um, over, over the, set, the same time period, so it's traveling quickly. It's sun synchronous, so it was a retrograde orbit, so it's going backwards. If it was prograde, it would be going that way around the orbit, but it's retrograde, it's going that way. Um, so this is a, a sun-synchronous orbit ground track as it goes. And again, you can see it's got a very, very high inclination because it was tipped um, up towards up towards the poles. It's a polar orbit, so you can see, look into that ground. There's lots of indicators there that show you what it is. The next one we've got at the bottom left here is um, a medium Earth orbit. And again, there's a relatively high inclination here, so just under 60 degrees. It's prograde, it's traveling this way in the direction. And it's symmetrical, it's a circular orbit. So this is the same shape as this. Um, so there's lots you can tell off that orbit, and then you'd be able to find the period by looking at the time displacement between the orbits. At the top right then, it's just a rehash of what we just spoke about, a geostationary or geosynchronous. Geostationary is at 36,000 kilometers um, from the Earth, so rotates in 24 hours, but has an inclination. So geosynchronous is this one, sorry, that does this figure of eight pattern. But if it doesn't have an inclination, it's at zero. It's then this one, which is a fixed point in the sky. And this one I've also put um, at the same line of longitude and latitude here, at zero. So it's actually would be in line with Earth and London. So this would be a great comm satellite over the Earth. It would be fixed in the sky and you just look at zero inclination at the equator looking south. And there are comm satellites we use that are there. And then the last one I'll show is an example of the highly elliptical orbit, the Molnir or tund Tundra orbit. Um, and you know this is elliptical because it's not symmetrical up above. So if you look at a line across the equator here, the top of this doesn't look like the bottom of this. So it's an elliptical orbit. And then if you think about spacecraft traveling faster when they're closer uh, and slower when they're further away, well, this part here, it's, take, it's, it's hovering over the America and then it's going quickly across the ocean and then hovering over Russia and then quickly across the ocean. So this here is where it's furthest away from the Earth and down here is where it's closest to the Earth and it's, it's perigee because it's traveling faster. So perigee down here, apogee up here. Don't forget you could tip this upside down, and have this on the bottom half and it would it would be um, a Molnir orbit but just focus on the southern hemisphere so there's different ways of organizing it. Hopefully you'll be able to recognize that. So that's it. I've been through loads of questions. I've covered the main points in almost everything. Hopefully you should need to know. I've been talking for an hour um, on this recording. Um, week one, your notes are in chapter two. Week two, orbital concepts is 3.1. Week three, orbital motion is 3.2. Week four is chapter 3.3. .3, so there's your notes to dig into. Um, as I says, this session is recorded, so you can go back and look at it. If you've got any other questions that you don't want to ask now, or if you're watching the recording, um, then ask them on the Piazza forum and I'll answer. There's two more sessions this week there. So Ben, who's listening in, 
He's doing one on Wednesday afternoon at one o'clock, 1300. And I think he's covering orbital maneuvers, propulsion and laws, launch and ADCS. So slightly out four, five and nine in the chapters. And then Sahil on Friday at one o'clock will cover chapter six, seven, eight, thermal design, power systems and communications. So that's all I've got to teach you or, or, or to rehack with you. What I'm going to do now, I'll stop the recording. And thank you for anybody watching and recording. Um, and then I'm open for questions if anybody's got any. Let me just stop this, stop sharing. And stop the recording.